Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Jen Blood. Hi Jen. Hi Joanna. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. So Jen is the best-selling author of the Erin Solomon Thriller series, which is super, as well as being a fantastic editor at Adian Editing. And Jen has been my own fiction editor for over a year now, I think, and, you know, really improved my <laughs> writing. So Jen, I'm so pleased to have you on the show. It's super. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. This is very cool. <laughs> it is. And of course, you normally get to edit me and we don't talk about editing. So uh, today we're going to get into it. So first of all, tell us a bit more about you and your writing background. Sure. Uh, well, basically, I started writing when I was, um, or I started professionally writing about 15 years ago. And uh, I have a an undergraduate and a graduate degree in creative writing. I've worked basically every job you can comprehend <laughs> um, in writing. So I've been a reporter and I've been a, um, a proofreader and an editor for newspaper and I've um, ghost written and just tons of weird and good and not so good jobs I'm um, having to do with writing. And so I've been doing it for a while and uh, First um, self-published my Aaron Solomon series in uh, 2012, and so I have five of those out now, and I um, first opened the doors officially to my editing business in 2014. Yeah, wow, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of progression and a lot of writing, um, but yeah. today we're really, um, we're going to come back to the Aaron Solomon stuff, but let's, mm -hmm. you know, just the basics, because when people say, oh, you know, what about an editor, um, an editor can actually mean a lot of different things, can't it? So can you explain, um, I guess, the different types of editing that an author might encounter? Sure. And it does. It definitely varies depending on um, where you are as a writer and kind of what your what your goals as a writer may be. I have some um, writers who are very focused on um, getting books out, and um, so with those, then my job is a little bit more intensive. Then I have others who are focused on traditional publishing, and they're very keen on. Um, basically really honing every sentence and um, yeah so it varies depending on what your goals are but essentially the different types of editing are uh, there's beta reading there is uh, content editing there's copy or line editing um, and there's proofreading so those are the general um, types that are out there mm. and I think the like you said, it's, it differs depending on where you are as an author. Mm -hmm. um, and would you say that people probably need to spend the most on editing for their first book and, and therefore it becomes like a big stumbling block at the beginning? Yeah, that definitely is the cast 22 is that um, it's before you made much money or any money um, <laughs> from your writing, that's when you need to shell out the most. And... Um, yeah, and I really do. I think it's a very worthwhile investment um, to take that extra time and work with someone who really knows what they're doing, uh, that you trust, so that you, the two of you can sort of work together to achieve this vi the vision that you have of what you want your novel to be. Mm. And so, because I mean, a lot of people will say, well, I, I mean, I get emails and people say, oh, well, I want an editor, but I only want to spend a little bit. Um, do, do you, I mean, do you think you get what you pay for in terms of editing? You know, I really do. I think that you do. I mean, there are definitely, there are, there are good editors that are out there who are just starting out maybe, and so their, their rates aren't quite as high, but the reality is that, um, yeah, if you're looking for someone that not only knows how to edit well and can work with you um, throughout, you know, from the developmental edit through um, to the point where you're publishing, but also knows a little bit about the genre and the market and there's a lot to know 
um, as an editor. And so I think that if you're going to get that level of experience, then you are going to need to pay a little bit more. So it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it doesn't need to, you don't need to go into debt for the rest of your life. It, it's something that I think people, you may have to pinch pennies for a little while, but I think ultimately it's usually worth it for people. Mm. And I mean, I try and frame it as an investment, um, mm. you know, as in if you're expecting to make money from your book as a business, mm -hmm. then you need to invest money in that book to make it the best product yes. it can be. Um, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I mean, I think I actually have several clients who have come to me after they've gotten, they've spent a little bit less on editing, um, and actually had the novel published and have gotten feedback that it's not great editing and stuff. And so they come to me after the fact. And so, you know, that's, that's an example of a sort of paying through the nose by not just, you know, biting the bullet and paying up front for, for, um, what you need um, mm. to make it happen. Yeah, and another question um, I get surprisingly often, maybe you hear this too, is uh, I'm worried about sending a book to an editor because they might steal my ideas. Um, what, what's your answer to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that especially for new writers, that's a really, that's a big concern. That's something that they worry about a lot. And the reality is that I think it's the same with pretty much any, um, if you talk to veteran authors and you, and you uh, talk about the idea of worrying about someone stealing your idea and stuff, generally what they tell you is that it's not the idea that you need to worry about because everybody, you know, everybody has ideas and whatever. It, it's your unique take on that idea. It's your, it's the way that you write it. It's all of that that makes it your novel. And so in that sense, it's unlikely that somebody is going to outright steal something like that. If you are concerned, I actually do have in part of my contract that, you know, the, if this is um, solely your property. And so I think that you can certainly incorporate that or, or talk to your editor about it if it's something that you're concerned about. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because you do a, a contract, and I've worked with a lot of a lot of editors over the years now, and not all of them do have a contract. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's more like a you know more of a handshake agreement, and you know you could pay a deposit, but you know that there wasn't necessarily a contract. So. What do you feel is the editor's job uh, and what do you put in that contract so people can kind of assess their options? Mm. Well, basically, I think that the editor's job, again, it really depends on the client in terms of uh, what they're looking for. But for me personally, I view my job as doing everything that I can to deliver the a professionally put together novel that is at the highest caliber possible and so that means that uh, obviously in terms of like grammar and punctuation and all of those things that it's it's free of that stuff but beyond that it's uh, making sure that the characters ring true and the pacing is uh, consistent throughout and, and will keep the reader coming back and uh, yeah, that it's just, it's a high level of prose, but the, all of that stuff. And so in terms of what's in the contract, that for me really was, it's interesting, like the evolution of the contract, because I hadn't, I'd been sort of running a business and hadn't been really focused on it for a while. It, it had been running on the sidelines, but I'd been doing other things and, and you know, did editing, but I also did some graphic design, and you could hire me for all these different things. When I made the decision that I was exclusively going to be an editor, then it was almost a psychological thing for me to just be like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do it right. I'm going to get the contract. I'm going to, uh, you know, get the logo and do all of these things and, and make this a business uh, venture. And so... Uh, yeah, so it was kind of um, along those lines. And basically, in terms of the contract, it really is just um, letting the client know what they can expect from me, letting them know that their work is safe with me, 
uh, letting them, you know, talking about uh, payment schedule and, and all of those things so that everything is sort of defined on the page as we start. Mm. And another important thing there is date, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the date that the client has to deliver the book, as in you've agreed what date, mm -hmm. and then the date that you will give it back again. And I mean, I know this is a massive deal because, uh, you know, from your point of view, people have to book editors, don't they, in mm -hmm. advance. You cannot just go, oh, my book's ready to edit today. I'm just going <laughs> to send it to somebody. How long should people be thinking in advance? Uh, at this point, well, I've, actually, I'm not taking new clients right now, but... Um, in general, for any... Editor. In general, though, when I am, then it's usually, you should be th thinking at least two months in advance. Um, that's, yeah, it's a minimum of two months in advance. You should um, check in and, and make sure that there's space and connect with the, the editor, particularly if it's someone that you haven't worked with before. Mm -hmm. then um, two to three months is usually safe to sort of get the ball rolling. Yeah, and then obviously you can kind of finesse that timing uh, yeah. as you get closer to it. Um, yeah. And then obviously you say what date you're going to give it back again, which I think all editors would do, right? Would say, yeah, it'll take, well, how long will it take usually to do a full edit? Yeah, and uh, typically that's, <laughs> it's take, it's um, been a learning process for me. So it, it depending on how extensive the edits are and how long the book is, then anywhere from two to four weeks basically is what you're looking at. Mm, absolutely, so. no, that's super. Um, and then I think about dating as dating. <laughs> I think about editing. Yes, yes indeed. I think, I think a whole other <laughs> interview. <laughs> Yes, no, I think about editing as a bit like dating in mm -hmm. that you don't, because people say, well, how do I find an editor? And it's like, well, you don't just look on the internet, find the first one and book them. Um, that's not really how you do it. There is a bit of kind of looking around before you find someone who might match. So how do you recommend people find the best editor for them? Um, you know, word of mouth, I think is huge. It, uh, if you are reading a novel, particularly by independent um, authors. If you're reading a novel and you find that um, you really like it, it's you know well, it's error free and and uh, the pacing is good and character and all of these things. Then uh, independent authors are usually pretty approachable. So just you know send them a line and say hey you know who edited your work. Um, that, I think, is one of the best ways to find out. And uh, from there, you know, check out the website or uh, send a query to the editor just finding out what their availability is and what their specialty is. Most editors have a particular genre that they work with. And um, in my opinion, it is very important to work with an editor who really knows your genre. Uh, yeah, it just it doesn't make sense. There's so many uh, subtle differences between the genres that is really good to work with someone who's very enthusiastic about the genre you work in. Mm. So um, yeah, I think that those are the major things. And then yeah, it really is. It's a word of mouth and kind of reading the different uh, blogs that are online and uh, reading interviews with different editors and stuff like that. And then, ultimately, the biggest test is going to be corresponding with the editor and uh, how they respond to you and what that kind of interaction is like and that kind of thing. Mm. And, yeah, it's funny you say that. Um, you know, I found you after my previous editor resigned because of a particularly um, gory scene in <laughs> one of my books. <laughs> And, and you were like, yeah, this is great. And, you know, I, that's really important, isn't it? To find somebody, mm -hmm. you know, and you're a thriller writer, so that's why right. we resonate. Um, but just back on finding the right editor, do editors still do that kind of test edit on a chapter? Is that something that people can do? Yeah, definitely. I think um, most editors at this point do offer some kind of sample edit. They may charge for it, they may not. Um, don't be turned off in either case. Um, 
if it's free, that's great. If it's not, then, you know, it's usually, you certainly shouldn't pay a lot for a sample edit. It's usually $25, $50 is maximum for a sample edit usually, and I think that's pretty high. Mine are 25 mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I and that is... I think a really important thing to have. It just it gives you a really good idea of how the editor works, what you can expect from them in terms of feedback, and whether or not they kind of get what you're going for with your books. Mm. So. Yeah, which is which is um, interesting. And then, how is the best sort of way to prepare your manuscript before you submit to an editor? So, how can authors edit themselves before mm -hmm. going to a professional? Uh, I think the most important thing, especially with uh, newer writers, is beta readers. That's a really important thing. I think a lot of times when I'm working with newer writers, then I'll actually suggest, you know, doing, I'll either suggest doing a professional beta read or I'll suggest that they work with some beta readers on their own first. And that to me is, it's just invaluable to be able to get somebody else's perspective on how a novel is working. And so beta readers, beyond that, it's just, you know, basically paying attention to punctuation and grammar and, and uh, that stuff to some extent. And the other thing that I find particular with, particularly with newer writers is that a lot of times they'll have like a plot and subplots and some of the subplots don't necessarily resolve themselves in the novel in an early draft. So just as you're going through, uh, sort of write down what the plot and the subplots are and then make sure that you have some kind of resolution for each of those. Mm. And uh, if you can do that, then that means that uh, I think you're in pretty good shape to uh, start working with an editor. Yeah, I must say, I, I find your story comments really, really helpful. And I mean, sometimes, you know, you do your own edit and you can't see the problems or you know there's a problem but you just don't know how to fix it and mm -hmm. you know that's when having a, a professional like yourself to kind of look at it and go well look you didn't resolve this or you need a scene here that will wind up that thing mm -hmm. uh, you know you've suggested several things like that for me which have helped kind of finish internal circles you know almost which are just it's very hard to see yourself um, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. the problem when you're first starting out as a writer is you're scared of editing because <laughs> of the kind of the psychological pain. So I guess my question there is, how does someone know if it's a good edit? As in, what you don't want is a pat on the back. Oh, that was great. No issues at all. And you probably also don't want change every single line. So how do people kind of know what a good edit is if they haven't had one before? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think that basically, uh, as you said, you know, uh, you definitely don't want to pat on the back if you're paying good money, then, you know, what's the point? Um, basically, it's a matter, I think it's, at least with my own edits, it's a matter of, and I think with editors that I've worked with on my own writing, it's a matter of the way that the editor approaches it. There should be some amount of positivity from the start. I think that the editor should be enthusiastic in some way with the story that you're telling and should be able to point out, you know, you're doing this right, you're doing this right, uh, you're almost there with this, and if you do X, Y, and Z, then you're going to be there. And I think sort of couching though couching it in those terms and then beyond that sort of recognizing particularly if a new if you're a newer writer that uh, there is going to be some red on the page and sometimes it's going to be fairly ex extensive so but the editor should be able to put a positive spin on it you shouldn't feel like you're being beaten up uh, when you're when you're being edited yeah I think it at the beginning it is really difficult 
and you just kind of have to get used to it and realize you're paying for someone to help you make the book a better product yes um and that that to me is kind of the essence of an editor and mm -hmm. i just don't think you can do it for yourself um you know it's very I and mean, we're going to come back to you and how you do it in a minute but yeah. um <laughs> can we just uh what you, I mean, you said there that you will um, sometimes recommend people go and get another B to read. When will you actually reject a client? As in, what are the kind of characteristics of a, this This ain't good enough yet? Mm -hmm. Basically, it's, at this point, I have uh, a questionnaire that I give out to a potential client. I ask for a sample chapter the first chapter and then I ask for about 25 to 35 pages in the middle of the novel. If in reading that what I'm finding is that there's a lot of uh, head hopping which is the thing where you're switching perspectives uh, sort of willy-nilly between the different characters. Uh, a lot of sort of it's the whole telling rather than showing if I'm seeing a lot of that on the page and then in terms of pacing and, and that kind of thing, if I see a lot of that and on the questionnaire the author is having a hard time defining A, what the plot is, um, one of the questions I ask is what the catalyst for that everything sets, that sets everything in motion for the story. If they can't define what that is, and what the character's central conflict is, then that usually is a good indication that you're not quite ready for an editor, and it's a good idea to uh, get beta readers just to start things out. Mm. That's, that's really interesting. I must say, I think the point of view, uh, which you said as perspective there, that mm -hmm. is kind of one of those penny-dropping moments um, mm -hmm. that happens, I think, when you start to learn to write a novel. That's kind of one of the big things, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and it is. It's very hard. It's definitely, it's so much easier <laughs> to tell a story if you can just tell it from every, everybody's perspective. And so, um, yeah, to sort of discipline yourself and say, oh, you know what, uh, we can't just switch from this person to that person without preparing the reader in some way or, you know, making some kind of clean division or whatever. So, uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's just one of those things that with time, it becomes natural, but early on, it's, it's a hard thing to grasp. It's hard. And then I, uh, what I also th think is that, you know, other things come up every time. So, uh, like on my last book, um, I was using the comma and ing, you know, something in mm -hmm. a lot. And you were like, you should, you know, you're using this too much. Can you explain that in proper English, what I, just, what I was getting wrong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can try. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's actually, that's another one that's a very, that's very common, is looking at the rhythm of a paragraph. If you're using the same kind of if you're using the same kind of sentences over and over again, like one of the obvious is if every sentence begins with he did this or he did that, or mm. uh, as you get more advanced, then you know to avoid that, but then you can fall into the trap of, as you said, the ing trap, which is uh, he he went to the bank flying along the way and you know, something like that where you start that and that's fine, but then if you have sentence, another sentence that mm. follows that same pattern, then it, uh, yeah, it just gets um, tiresome for the reader. So it's kind of looking at that kind of thing. Yeah, and you just don't see it on your own. And it, uh, and it's funny mm. you say that about the so-and-so did this, then that. And I remember the first, uh, you know, I with the point of view thing, often it's good to start a chapter with Morgan walked into the bar or whatever, and then the next chapter you're like, okay, now this is Jake. Jake did this. And then you realise that you've just started every chapter with somebody's yeah. name because it helped you write it. But then you yeah. then have to go back and change all the beginning sentences so they don't all start with a name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and but it really is, I think it's just impossible for um, 
or not impossible. You know, nothing's impossible. I'm sure there are people who can do it, but um, it's very difficult for a writer to be able to see all of that. There's so much to see yeah. in a novel. Um, so trying to see that for yourself is just, it's really hard. So I can't do it. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, and then you have a um, a master's in uh, commercial fiction, which I think is awesome. Uh, so first of all, uh, tell us why why differentiate uh, in that way? When why did you specialise down that route? Uh, well, I got my undergraduate degree in literary fiction, and. So I was, and actually toward my final year in school, I was starting to sort of drift toward uh, popular fiction a little bit more and had actually written the first draft of uh, All the Blue-Eyed Angels, uh, my first novel, uh, had written it at that time. And so I was really starting to get interested in mysteries. And then the graduate school that I applied to, uh, university, or one of them, uh, the University of Southern Maine, Dennis Lehane was teaching there at the time, uh-huh. and I love him. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to work with him. Uh, but you couldn't actually, new students couldn't actually work with him unless they were declared uh, popular fiction. So that kind of made the decision for me. I was like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is what we're going with. And, uh, but I really enjoyed it. It was actually, it was, I, as, as I said, I spent my undergrad reading literary fiction and really focusing on that. And I'm glad that I did that because it gave me a really good foundation for prose and, uh, character and all the things that you sort of are emphasized a little bit more in literary fiction. But then being able to make that transition to popular fiction where the emphasis is on plot and pacing and pulling all of those elements together was a really cool marriage, I think. It was a nice way to kind of finish out my professional or my, uh, yeah, my education. Yeah. No, I think I think it really does offer more, from, you know, in terms of I really feel like you can analyze a story a lot more the stuff that you point out is kind of different to what I've had before um, and one of the the things uh, I wondered about you was how do you separate your creative writing mind from your editing mind because you know this is we're, we're taught to well we're told by many people just write the first draft don't edit as you write how does an editor who's also a writer manage that that shift uh, it's not easy, <laughs> but uh, when I first started writing, uh, when I was, you know, in high school and, and uh, even before that, I was a big fan of uh, Natalie Goldberg, mm, oh, yeah. who wrote like Wild Writing Mind and Writing Down the Bones and Long Quiet Highway, and she is a big advocate of the timed write, where you just sit down and you just move your pen across the paper or you just keep typing or however you do it without rereading, without stopping, you just, you have a topic and you just write. And I still do that. That's kind of, that's the way that I do my first drafts. I still, I, <laughs> I do uh, write all of my first drafts longhand, which oh, I know makes me I know a dinosaur, <laughs> but, wow. but I do. I can't do it any other way. So, Yeah, I just, I will have a specific scene in mind that I know I need to write. I'll sit down and I will uh, write it all out and without stopping, without um, second guessing or anything like that. And then from there, I type it into the computer. So that's the only, but that's the only time I'll I'll allow myself to reread it until I'm about 25 to 35,000 words in. And then I'll go back and start looking at plot stuff to make sure that I'm still on the right track. But uh, it really is, it's its kind of discipline. It's just kind of saying, all right, you have to accept that it's not going to be great. Mm. <laughs> that first draft isn't going to be genius. And uh, it really is true what everybody says. You know, It's a matter of getting it on the page to begin. And then you can start working through. And that it's no different for, um, certainly no different for me. Mm. Do you do you write in order then? Do you write your whole book in order? 
Yeah, I usually do. I usually, um, I, if I'm really stuck and the book is driving me nuts and there's a scene that I'm excited about, then I'll let myself take a day off and go back and write the scene that I'm excited about. But, uh, and then I'll get back to the drudgery of, you know, whatever, because uh, sometimes it is drudgery. It's, let's be honest. <laughs> Was that a little slip there? No, I agree with you. And I, you know, I'm in the first draft at the moment and it's like, oh, goodness me. <laughs> oh, no, I'm interested. Do you have like on your hand? Because I mean, I just don't write by hand anymore. Does it, do you really get bad pain in your hand or do you have like lumps and bumps on your writer's hand? I'm really interested. Um, I, I have, I have, a, I do have a callus. I have my writing callus, yeah. um, that I've had, but, uh, I'm just so used to it. I just I have a notebook that I take with me everywhere, and and uh, I usually, especially if it's nice out, then I'll try to get outside and um, sit outside and write uh, that way as much as I can, especially this time of year. But uh, yeah, I I have tried with a laptop. I've tried with I can't do first drafts oh, wow. with anything other than uh, pen to paper, no, so. <laughs> which is brilliant because that's. I think you're the first person I've had on the show who writes longhand for the whole draft, at least. So when you edit, do you print out and edit, as in self-edit, do you print it out from the computer and edit by hand again? No. No, it's all, it really is, it's just that first draft. Once the first draft is done, then I'm fine to move on to the computer. And uh, I don't, I don't usually go back to, um trying to think. Yeah, I don't usually go back to uh, writing anything longhand after that. It really is just uh, the process of getting that first draft out. And then from then, from there, I do everything with uh, track changes on, lo on uh, the computer and stuff. So. Oh, okay, because I do print out um, my first draft and edit by Oh, interesting. Hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's true. So I write the first draft in Scrivener and then I print it out, scribble, and then put the changes back in. So Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So everyone has their own little little stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so I do, let's just come back to my editing question, then we'll come back to your books. Um, I wanted to, you know, a lot of people say, uh, well, that, you know, say I get my edits back, and what if I don't agree with the changes? Does an author have to make the changes an editor suggests? Definitely not, unless it's... Unless I'm the editor, and then you should definitely do it, everything I say. <laughs> no, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, the the editor isn't some all-knowing entity. If there's something that you have a real problem with, or it just strikes you as this isn't quite what works for you, then, yeah, I mean, it's it's ultimately, it's your novel. If there's something big and the editor is kind of pushing you toward it, then it's a good idea to, rather than just discounting that as outright wrong, mm. it is a good idea to maybe get somebody else's opinion. So if you have a beta reader or something like that, then uh, you can run it by them and see what they think. Uh, I know that... I know that there are certainly times when I'm working with um, an author and... I make a suggestion and they're not crazy about it and they sort of initially there's they kind of get their back up and, and are like absolutely not that's not what my character is about um, I think as a writer what you need to just be able to do is decide whether that's your ego talking or whether it really is about mm. the book and the integrity of the novel so because it I'm for me, it, a lot of times it's ego. A lot of times it's me saying, no, you know, this is the way that I've imagined it. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, it definitely, it's up to you. And so if there's something that strikes you as wrong, then, mm -hmm. yeah, stick to your guns or, or uh, talk to your editor about it. And, uh, yeah, maintain your vision for what the novel is going to be. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I would say I probably make 80 to 85% of the changes that you recommend. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there are a few, I mean, one thing is a cultural difference. So uh, I remember one example, um, I said something like the city of London. And in London, we have a city with a capital 
C, <laughs> which is like a subset of the city with small C. And it was just that, you know, it was like, that's an example of something where it's a cultural kind of difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then another question on cultural differences, um, should an author, a self-published author, uh, use American or British English or Australian English for that matter? Yeah, <laughs> it really depends. I think it depends um, A on the audience you're shooting for and B uh, where the novel takes place, interestingly enough. I have, I'm actually working with um, an Australian author right now whose um, book takes place in Seattle and all of his characters are American. So to me that it makes sense. Uh, we agreed that it would be American spelling and stuff. But uh, I've, I've also, I've worked with other authors whose novels take place in England and, and uh, they do prefer going with uh, British spelling. So yeah, just look at uh, where it takes place and who your audience, mm -hmm. who you're targeting primarily. I think I've, I mean, I've generally tried for American, but I know I'm a bit of a hybrid, as in I'll still say things like torch <laughs> instead of flashlight and, you know, and lift instead of, what is it, escalator, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, But I haven't found people, I don't think people really care that much. You know, some authors get so het up about this, but I think it's a procrastination issue, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, just stop, that's not the point, you know. If it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it's a good story, no one actually cares, you know, about yeah. that type of thing. Yeah, and I think especially now, where we do live in such a global sort of setting, it's just, yeah, I mean, people accept that there are different ways to spell things and different way, you know, different words for different things, and it's not a huge deal. Mm, so. Exactly. Um, and then another question that uh, I get a lot, um, which is, how do I know my writing's good enough? So people particularly who are going to self-publish. So in the old model, you would get chosen by an agent and chosen by a publishing house. In the new model, where we have to choose ourselves, how do people know that their book is good enough to publish? Uh, that's a tough one. That's definitely a tough one. That's where... Um beta readers really do come in handy and because again this is people who are just starting out uh, once you've got a book or two under your belt then you're a little bit more obviously seasoned and, and uh, know that you can do it but um, yeah initially it's having a beta reader a couple of beta readers it's having an editor you trust who isn't afraid to say you know what you're not ready to go to print just yet uh, and then it's I mean, it really is so much faith. It's so much just deciding, all right, you know, this is this is what I want, and I want it badly enough to take that risk, because every every writer, regardless of how good they are, if you're a self-published author, then you have, then you're experience, experiencing that doubt, mm -hmm. and it's a matter of take, taking that leap, and then, and uh, seeing what happens from there. But before you take the leap, yeah, beta readers editor you trust and uh, yeah go on and, from there and, and just do it and if you get a really really load of bad reviews then you can always unpublish it and get it re yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly worst case scenario it's 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 not a great novel and you yeah, can do that yeah um on that question I mean you know, I mean, obviously, I'm a proud indie, and you know, it, it, this is not a casting aspersions or anything. But have do you? What do you think is the state of the quality of indie work? Do you see that it's getting better, or you know, what do you think the tsunami of crap thing is in any way true, given what you see as an editor? Um, you know, I think I honestly think that the tsunami of crap is sort of it it kind of is sort i think we're over the crap storm <laughs> yay <laughs> yeah i think that because the people who really weren't paying who really didn't care that much and just wanted to get their novel out i think that first influx when self editing was so or when self publishing was so easy and suddenly accessible and everybody was publishing i think now people realize that you don't become a millionaire publishing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
And so if that's all they were in it for, because remember, like, with the whole Amanda Hawking thing and John Locke and everybody was like, oh, my God, I can make millions this way. (laughs) Yay! Uh, Yeah. Now that sort of reality has set in, then the people who were only in it to, because they had visions of grandeur or whatever, have kind of fallen off. And the people who have stuck with it have realized that they really need to put out a quality novel if they're going to do anything mm. and so by and large the op- the people that I work with are um, they're really committed to being better writers and they work really hard uh, to get there and I have tremendous pr- respect for the work that they put into it mm. so uh, no, yeah I mean I, th- I think that the quality is getting better all the time Yeah, I agree with you. And that's actually why it's becoming more difficult because the people you're kind of competing with, yeah, the quality (laughs) is very high. And in fact, I'm reading a book at the moment, I won't say the author, but the editing is shocking on it, as in the, the, um, it's a traditionally published book and it's full of typos, like a lot of typos. And, you know, which is annoying to me. And I think I'm less forgiving when it's traditionally published. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know oh I yeah, mean? I definitely am. I'm yeah. I get I get very annoyed when I see a lot of. Um, I I mean I do anyway if if there are yeah. a lot of blatant errors. Yeah. But especially with traditional publishing, I just feel like yeah, come that's on, the guys. thing. They're supposed to. You know, yeah, they're supposed that's to be why you do it. <laughs> but um, I do want to ask you then. You know, because I'm writing number seven, um, novel number seven, and it's uh, you know I'm in that. Uh, saggy middle kind of crappy um drudgery as you mentioned um and it's you know it's really difficult and I wonder what you think when when do you get to the point where you feel like you can tell a good story and that you're a decent enough writer how many books does it take Oh my god, I don't know that it happens, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I really hope it does one day. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think, like, I've I've seen interviews with, like, Nora Roberts and stuff where she talks about the fact that halfway through a novel she sort of goes through that, that phase. So, um, obviously not the phase where, you know, am I, am I good enough cause able I to do this and yeah. whatever, but... Uh, I think that it gets a little bit better with every novel that you do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I yeah, it's I think funny. it's it's yeah, it really is. It's just a matter of continuing to do it and and uh, and then sort of looking at feedback and and uh, recognizing that you know your your people are in agreement that well, I mean, in your case, people are in agreement that you're writing a really good story, and so. It's starting to trust that, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think yeah. too. I think the, the writer's doubt thing, the self-doubt is, uh, the self-doubt and the ego balance. I mean, you have to have a big enough ego to want to publish anything, but mm-hmm. then you've got this massive self-doubt that kind of yeah. overshadows you every time. I had a particularly bad case of the, oh my goodness, I'll never have another idea again, um, you know, earlier this year, um, after one day in New York, I just thought, I, I don't know what, I don't think I'll ever be able to write again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those crazy moments. And then, you know, you sit down, like Natalie Goldberg says, you sit down with the blank page and you force yourself to write something and something <laughs> comes. So um, so let's just talk about your um, pentalogy. Uh, tell us uh, about the Erin Solomon books. All right. So, yes, I have, uh, it's now complete. Uh, so five books, uh, the Aaron, Aaron Solomon Pentology. And it basically tells the story of this investigative reporter who returns to her hometown to uh, investigate a an alleged cult suicide that took place when she was a child. And uh, she witnessed her father was uh, actually part of the church. He survived, but... Uh, yeah, so it's kind of her going back and investigating this, and then through the course of these five novels, sort of realizing that her father played a fairly big role in everything that unfolded. And a lot of it is about sort of reconciling our memories of what 
we perceived our, our what we perceived our lives to be as children and stuff with the reality of what was really there. Obviously, it's a little bit more dramatic <laughs> with this, but I think it's something thrillers. that everyone kind of goes through in, in some way. So <laughs> Yeah, and there it's thrillers and there is high body count and explosions. I can uh, attest to that. And lots of dogs. You love dogs, don't you? I do love dogs. <laughs> that's, that's my next series. So uh, is uh, doing working with uh, search and rescue dogs in uh, the next series. So I'm excited about that. But uh, yeah, Aaron has a dog. He plays a big role in it. And uh, yeah, he's there. And then there's, you know, there's obviously there's romance in there, which I can't, I can't actually write something if there's not some kind of romance in there. I'm just, I get <laughs> Everybody needs a love angle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but it is, it's fun. It was really fun to write. And uh, it's been really rewarding just kind of seeing that arc to its completion. Yeah, so, and I was going to ask you about that, because you managed to, did, did you plan five novels up front, or did you just start writing and, and it turned into five? It did, uh, well, initially, like, with the first novel, or the first draft, it was eight novels, initially. <laughs> uh, when I finished the about halfway through the final draft of uh, the first novel, I did an outline of all five books, and uh, because because it is uh, sort of serialized, I mean they're they're definitely interlinked, and so it was very important that I have an idea from the start where I was going with things and how the mystery was going to resolve itself and all of that. So, yeah. Pretty much from the start, I knew that it was going to be multiple, and then by the time I finished the um, final draft of the first novel, I had complete outlines of all five. So, uh, how how long were those outlines? My outlining is n like stupid. <laughs> so my outlines are like twenty five pages long, and I go into. Uh, yeah, I go into excruciating detail in terms of, like, character development and character arc and where things are going to be and all of that stuff. I go into, uh, I usually include at least a little bit of uh, setting research in there, and um, then I try to do a full breakdown. I, I work according to, to the three-act structure, so I do a full breakdown of um, all three acts, so... Um, they're long. They're really long outlines. <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, I was I was talking about this with Ros Morris, who was on the show, and I said, you know, I think I can only hold three in my head. And the problem is, it's in my head. And what, you know, because I'm not a natural outliner, and I'm really mm -hmm. trying to be, like, I would love to be. And like I'm finding with Deviance, the third one in my London Psychic mm -hmm. series, I'm just... I am, it's difficult because I didn't plan it as three. I wrote the first one as a kind of standalone and then wrote another one. And now with the third one, it's really hard because you're trying to pull together threads that were almost shut. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, goodness, this would have been so much easier if I would have planned this better. So for the next, I want to try and write something else. But I'm, I'm thinking that I would only do three because three would be easier to plot. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and yeah. What's I'll never do a pentology. <laughs> no, it's like hardcore. And I, I, but I was going to say, I started reading. Is it Sins of the Father, the one with the upside down cross? Uh, Southern uh, Cross. The Southern text. Cross. Yeah, yeah, that one. Uh, I read that first. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it matters so much with yours if you read them out of order. Um, you can read mm -hmm. them out of order, like any series, and you can still fill in the blanks. Yeah. Um, to you know, and read them out of order. But um, so, tell, how, how are you plotting the the dog series, the new series? Um, right now, it's because I actually I have a prequel to the pentology that's coming out in June, July, in July, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm I'm still sort of focused on uh, tying that together at this point. But the dog series right now, I'm doing a lot of uh, research. I've outlined. Uh, I know it takes place in uh, northern Vermont, and I've done. 
yeah, I've done some rough writing, and then I have about a 20-page outline for that. And then these, this is going to be a series that is uh, standalone. And so, obviously, that still means with any series, there's always going to be with character develop, you know, character development and character arcs that continue throughout. But uh, in terms of the actual mysteries, they'll be standalone. So that's a little bit easier, I have to say. Yeah. So that's more more like my arcane books, which are kind of episodic almost. Yeah. 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 Which I think it is. It's nice to have something that's open ended. That you know, you can just. Yeah. Yeah, do it that way. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? And the more you learn about this, the more you're like, the more you learn, the more you realize you have to learn. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's endless. It really is. It's just, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy how much there is to learn. So, it But is. it's really fun. I mean, I it love kind of figuring fun. out new stuff about it and everything. So. Yeah. It is. Um, and I was going to ask you, do you have any uh, books that you recommend on editing that you particularly like? On editing, I. It's a good question. <laughs> I put you on the spot I, there. <laughs> yeah, I basically I use the I use the Chicago Manual of Style, uh, in terms of for like stylistic stuff. It's funny. I really don't use. It's so sad. I don't really use books that much. I go to there are go to uh, websites hmm. that I'll go to uh, for. So, like, Grammar Girl is one that I go to a lot. And, uh, again, Chicago Manual of Style. Um, Oxford has a website for their uh, editing. And, yeah, it really, at this point, is so much going to the Internet. And if I have a specific question about, you know, punctuation or something like that, then I'll go to uh, the Internet to figure that out. But uh, in terms of editing itself... I don't really use that many. Hmm. So. Oh, no, that's, that was just a little question I had. And, and then I've just realized a little follow-up question. We talked a lot. You call them beta readers. I call them beta readers. We didn't actually explain what they are. So let's just tie that up. Can you just explain them? Yeah, sure. Uh, beta or beta, whatever you want to call them, <laughs> readers are essentially readers that when you have a completed draft of your novel that you feel... You feel like you've reached a point where you can't really make any more changes knowledgeably, but you don't think you're ready for an editor yet, then beta readers are, sometimes they're professionals. I do it um, professionally myself, and uh, I know there are other people who offer it as a service, or there are a lot of uh, fellow writers out there who uh, will do it for you in exchange for a beta read of their novel. And uh, they're essentially, they go through and they don't do editing, but they'll look at the big picture of your novel. They'll make sure that the plot, they'll tell you if the plot works, if the characters make sense, if there are big holes in, in uh, sort of what you've set, then they'll let you know uh, those big picture things that is really important when you're first getting a novel completed. Mm. That's where they come into play. And really important to only use beta readers who like your genre. So I wouldn't give mine to uh, romance readers, for example. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's really key. <laughs> yeah, super important. All right, Jen, where can people find you and your books and your editing services online? Uh, well, they can find, I have, uh, for my author stuff, I'm at jenblood.com. My editing stuff is adianediting.com. And then I'm on Twitter at Jen Blood, and uh, I'm on Facebook and all of those places. And then my books are on, uh, let's see, they're everywhere. They're yeah. on Amazon and the iStore and Kobo and Nook. And, uh, and then uh, you can get the print through uh, Amazon and uh, Barnes and & Noble, I believe, and, uh, or through the website. Oh, so. and, and of course, there's a question I also forgot. Is Jen Blood your real name? Yes, it really is. <laughs> it's like pen, isn't it? It's pe pen and blood yeah. together, we're pretty good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks for your time, Jen. That was great. Excellent. Thanks so much.